नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू बी आई सी टॉक्स अ पॉडकास्ट बाय बैंगलोर इंटरनेशनल सेंटर ब्रिंगिंग यू कॉन्वर्जेशन दैट मूव इन फॉर्म एंड एनकरेज डिस्कॉस If you look at the constitutional text, if you look at the constitution structure, and if you look at the judicial interpretation of the constitution over the last seven decades, these three things, what you find is a centralizing drift. Over the years, there has been a gradual move along these six axes of contestation towards a central and centralized idea of power at the cost. of more plural decentralized visions you see manifestations of it over the last few years because what you have is after many years of coalition government you have a majority government in power that is determined to push the limits of its power under the constitutional framework so you see manifestations of it a lot in the last few years but it would be a mistake to think of it as a problem of the present government it is a problem that is in my view much deeper and is baked into the text and the structure and the interpretation of the constitution over the years this episode of bic talks is an extract from an in person event that took place in early november 2022 titled conversations with power looking at the indian constitution with lawyer and legal scholar gautam bhatia This talk by Gautam will consider the Indian constitution as a terrain of contestation between different visions of power. It will ask how the constitution creates power, who wields power, and upon whom, and how power is constrained. Using the example of federalism, it will argue that even as the constitution is contested terrain, its history has been marked by a centralizing drift. an incremental shift towards a homogenous and centralized vision of power at the expense of other more plural visions and now over to gautam thank you thank you so much thank you for inviting me it's always nice to be back in bangalore a city where i spent many happy years the ideas that form the base of this talk had their life or had their origin in certain events that took place on 5th of august 2019 which you all remember the various sort of constitutional and parliamentary moves that led to the effective abrogation of article 370 of the indian constitution and the degradation of the erstwhile state of jammu and kashmir into a centrally controlled union territory around 24 hours after these events when most of us were still just trying to figure out what exactly had happened i was approached by a couple of petitioners to file a case challenging these set of moves in the court and me and a couple of colleagues then uh, then drafted a constitutional challenge and when i first saw the presidential orders that were you know responsible for these sweeping changes it seemed to me that this was so egregious that it simply couldn't fly and well yes you know it may still fly in court you know because cases like this often have political significances that go beyond strictly legal arguments but it seemed to me that just looking at it as a constitutional lawyer this was so outrageous and what we call constitutional scullery that uh, it would have to be uh, at least in principle it was unconstitutional but then the more that i read and the more me and my colleagues read you know the text of the constitution article 370 its history and the judgments around it the more it turned out that the state did have a decent case much to my surprise and then there seemed to be a bit of a dissonance between what as an eyeball test just seemed so wrong but what nonetheless appeared to you know have some grounding or some sanction in the constitution of course i i still believe it's unconstitutional but it wasn't as clear cut as i originally thought and so that led me to question a settled belief that that I and others had had for a long time which was that the indian constitution is a wonderful document uh, it's transformative with something i've spoken of before the problem has been over the years uh, judges have stifled its transformative character and so if we could just get the right judgments you know the indian constitution would fulfill its transformative goal that uh, belief was thrown into some serious doubt and question 
when I and my colleagues studied the actual text of Article 370, its history and the seven decades of its operation. And that led us to believe that it, maybe we need to look at the constitution itself a little more critically, a little more closely. And, and hence, this talk, which shifts away a bit from my previous discussions about the Indian constitution's transformative character. So constitutions, by their very nature, have a story to tell. And when you look at the stories around the Indian constitution, there are three that stand out. One is the notion that the Indian constitution reflects simply a transfer of power between the erstwhile British government, colonial government, and the independent Indian government. Much of the administrative apparatus was, was retained. Many of the restrictive provisions like preventive retention were, were retained. And a large part of the text of the Indian constitution is a replica of the 1935 Government of India Act. So in that way, the Indian constitution is thought to be a document of continuity. The second story is the transformative story, which is that actually the Indian constitution was meant to mark a break from the colonial era, both in the political sense, in the sense that we moved from a colonial government to an independent republic. So in a political sense now, there was democracy, accountability, and so on. Also in a social sense that the constitution meant to interrogate social power structures around caste, uh, gender, economic disparity, and so on. And there you have a number of stories that branch out from this main story. So one common story is that um, for the first 25, 30 years, the Indian Supreme Court was a conservative court that um, interpreted the constitution in a conservative way. And that changed in the 1980s. After you know, the ADM Jabalpur habeas corpus judgment, in the emergency, the court repented. And uh, from the 1980s with the development of public interest litigation and the expansion of the fundamental rights chapter, the court began to move towards the constitution's transformative vision. Somewhat more critical story is that actually that's a bit of an overstatement. And while we do have transformative judgments, over the years, the court's orientation still remains broadly conservative. The third story is that the constitution essentially is a document of compromise. The Constituent Assembly was polyphonous, polyvocal. There were many competing interests. And finally, what is reflected in the document is a compromise that made everyone a little unhappy, but not too unhappy. And that is how we have been getting along since then. And if you look at the chapter on the directive principles of state policy, which has everything from labor rights to cow slaughter to you know, science, you, you see some of that compromise reflected there. So these are three broad stories about the Indian constitution, what it means and how it's embedded in our broader idea of nationhood. What's common to these three stories is that they all focus on one specific part of the Indian constitution, which is the fundamental rights chapter. So they focus on part three, which begins with the definition of the state, goes on to talk about equality, reservations, untouchability, free speech, life, personal liberty, forced labor, religion, minority rights, and so on. And the character of the Indian constitution is, um, is believed to flow from those rights and the principles that they embody, like secularism, certain kind of equal treatment, and so on. Now, that is, according to me, a somewhat limited view of the constitution. Because if you just look at the constitutional text, the fundamental rights chapter actually occupies about 10% of the total text of the Indian constitution. 90% of it that has nothing to do with rights. So the question is, what is in that 90% and why don't we really think about that when we think about the story the constitution is telling? And in this context, the work of a Latin American scholar, Roberto Gargarella, is very interesting because what he says is that, and this is in the context of studying two centuries of Latin American constitutionalism, that every constitution has two parts, an organic part and a dogmatic part. The dogmatic part is statements of rights, bills of rights, declarations of rights. This is, these are the rights that individuals have against the state, against each other, and so on. The other part is the organic part, which deals with how the constitution organizes power. So who has power, who doesn't have power, 
how is power exercised upon whom is it wielded how is it wielded and so on and the point that gargarella makes is that the two are connected and analyzing the long history of latin american constitutionalism he points out that starting with the mexican constitution of 1917 which was the outcome of a sustained revolutionary movement you had a process by which latin american constitutions began to set out wider and wider more and more inclusive bills of rights long before it became popular in the west social economic rights were part of latin american constitutions many other rights and with each successive constitutional slash revolutionary slash political movement the bills of rights would get bigger but at the same time those constitutions did not touch the organization of power which remained predominantly vested in the figure of the president the, those of you who have read latin american novels you know this is a very common theme the cordillo or the, the president who has a lot of power executive authority and how that leads to a certain kind of authoritarianism and so that has remained constant for two centuries even as bills of rights have grown and then gargarella points out that there is a link and as long as you leave this organic part what he calls the engine room of the constitution untouched you can have all the bills of rights that you want but until you democratize power itself it's going to be very hard to genuinely have transformation because the power to actually choose to implement or not those bills of rights still remains in an authoritarian sort of unaccountable center and that's the point that he makes and that's interesting because that does translate well it leads us to ask in the indian constitution because from 1980s onwards we've had a similar sort of expansion of our fundamental rights chapter at the instance of the courts so you know more and more rights article 21 is the repository of these rights sort of progressive if you look at it on paper but when it comes to the crunch not much of it actually works in any meaningful way then the question then is that is that because of the way that the indian constitution organizes power and that's the inquiry then we should um, we should turn to so when we think about the relationship between the indian constitution and power the first thing to note is that commonly constitutional theory that has been drawn from the united states and the you know the us constitution that sort of inaugurated the era of modern constitutionalism it thinks about constitutions as essentially constraining state power so the point of a constitution is to establish rule of law which in turn means that you place limits and checks upon the way that the state can exercise power upon individuals and so on and the first thing to note is that that is not the story of the indian constitution and its framing because when the indian constitution was being framed the economic social and cultural circumstances that the framers confronted were very different starting with widespread poverty and illiteracy the prospect of integrating more than 500 princely states into the union and the prospect of secessionist movements and so on all of that presented a very different challenge before the framers of the indian constitution and therefore and this is a point that has been made by the likes of uday mehta pratap banu mehta and so on is that the indian constitution was not about constraining power as much as it was about enabling power the idea was that you need to have state power you need to have political power in order to solve the problems that india faces at the scale at which it is facing so the constitution is meant to be enabling the deployment of that power so that we can you know deal with poverty deal with the social problems deal with structures like caste and so on when ambedkar says this many times you have to have a strong authority so that these sort of extra constitutional bodies can no longer exercise the sway that they do and so then of course that leads us to the next question which is that what does the indian constitution say about power its enablement and its use and its exercise and here i would say two things i think one is that if you look at the constitution like any written document that uses language when language being inherently subjective open to interpretation having silences having gaps it is a terrain of contestation that is inevitable wherever you use a written text as the basis for organizing social and political life so it is a terrain of contestation where different visions 
and ideas of power are articulated in different provisions in texts and in silences and often they are at odds with each other and there is then a constant struggle about which vision of power is meant to prevail or predominate and if you look at the constitution i would say that there are six such axes that emerge along which power is contested the uh, first one is just intuitive one it's federalism and centralism so the um, indian constitution is a federal constitution it article 1 says india that is bharat shall be a union of states so it is composed of the states after the 73rd and 74th amendments there are now three tiers of of governance so the center the states and local government each of which exercises a range and set of powers and in fact the illustration that i'll draw upon a little while later will actually be in the context of the federal compact so that's the first axis along which power is distributed in the center the central government central executive the parliament on the one hand and uh, state legislatures state executives on the other and to an extent the third third tier of governance as well the second axis is the parliament and the executive so if the center and the federal the states are sort of a vertical hierarchy of power sent at the center and then the states the legislature and executive are a horizontal there is a horizontal distribution of power india has a parliamentary form of government so the idea is that the executive and this is again of course theoretical in the real situation is much messier than this but that the executive implements laws parliament passes laws and executive is responsible to parliament so executive stays in power as long as it has the confidence of parliament and it's the two tasks are clearly delineated in all parliamentary systems whether it is the uk from which it originated in its modern form or elsewhere it is of course a constant struggle for supremacy between the executive and parliament executive keeps trying to dominate parliament parliament keeps trying to assert authority and a lot of this has to do with is there a coalition government is there a majority government and so on so that is the second axis along which power is distributed one interesting thing about the indian constitution and i'll come back to this is that over the years if you look at the evolution of the constitutional text and i don't mean <laughs> interpretation but the text you see an extensive strengthening of the executive at the cost of parliament so for example the anti defection law which is the 10th schedule effectively says that if a parliamentarian votes against the party whip and again i'm simplifying then they will be disqualified if they vote against the party whip what that basically means is that one very important source of pressure that parliament exercises over the executive in democracies in general which is that it can defeat the agenda of the executive in india goes away because because voting against the whip then means that you lose your seat and people don't want to do that obviously so that is one example of how the indian constitution through evolution and through amendments has decreased the power of parliament and has increased the power of the executive another example for instance is the speaker so in the uk the convention is that the speaker has to be independent and therefore when the speaker is elected then they are meant to resign their party membership they're no longer members of their parties and they are meant to represent the interests of parliament as a body against the executive whereas in india we know that that's not how it works speakers are invariably appointees of the ruling party and so therefore effectively the officer or the official who is the head of parliament is actually an executive appointee so again you have an issue so there are many such examples that show how even as in theory india is a parliamentary democracy if you go into the weeds you find that there are all these little little things that effectively disempower parliament and empower the executive and when you these days often people say parliament is dead you know it's not nothing happens there a large part of the reason why is that it's dead because the way the constitution structures par makes it easy for a strong executive to just marginalize parliament and that is attributable to how the constitution envisages that relationship the third axis is between homogeneity and pluralism so it has long been recognized that 
diverse societies, societies with a range of cultures, nations, ethnicities, languages, and so on, are often best held together through the mechanism of constitutional pluralism, which means that you don't have a one-size-fits-all when it comes to legal frameworks, governance, and so on, but you have you know, different arrangements that reflect the diversity of the nation. In the Indian constitution, one, one very prominent example was Article 370, because through that, given the unique historical situation in which Jammu and Kashmir acceded to the Indian Union, there was a certain kind of specific autonomy it was granted. Uh, it was the only state with its own constitution. And that is an example of what is technically called asymmetric federalism, that different states have different relationships with the union that reflects certain kind of pluralism. The other very prominent example is what we call the fifth and sixth scheduled areas, which are areas where indigenous peoples live and, um, and the constitution accords them a kind of self-governance, sort of structure of governance that differs from the rest of the country, a certain kind of autonomy is granted and so on. Even in Article 371, which is what comes after 370, you have 10 or 11 different sub-clauses where different states from Andhra Pradesh to Nagaland to Mizoram to Sikkim have different arrangements in various domains, including, for example, passing of laws, reservations, and so on, that again reflect the specific situations in those states. So that is an example of power as distributed between a homogenous view of how affairs will be run and a pluralistic view that allows to different components of the union a certain kind of autonomy in how they will run their own affairs. The fourth axis is between electoral institutions and guarantor institutions. Now, it's the classic theory of constitutionalism is that you have these three wings of state, executive, legislature, and judiciary, and power is divided among these three. That was never entirely true, and it is not true specifically for the complexity of modern states. So one set of institutions that have arisen in modern states are what go by a range of names, integrity institutions, guarantor institutions, fourth branch institutions, and so on. But they are broadly a set of institutions that are meant to exercise a certain kind of oversight over the executive that courts can't do because courts aren't equipped to exercise that kind of oversight. So what do I mean by that? For example, classically, an election commission. An election commission is an unelected body that is meant to exercise oversight over the process and conduct of elections and therefore has the power to enforce that elections happen in a free and, and fair way. Other instances include human rights commissions that are meant to, again, have a degree of independence from the executive so that they can exercise oversight over executive impunity and, and all of that. Information commissions, the RTI is an example of a body that is unelected that is meant to ensure that you can exercise transparency in governance. So you have all these bodies that are not elected, that don't draw their power from elections. But bodies you need to ensure that in very specific ways, governance and democracy and transparency and accountability go beyond simply periodic elections. And even in between elections, there are ways to hold the executive accountable and to exercise certain kinds of rights that uh, don't need you to wait till the next election and you can throw out those guys and bring in the next culture of guys. So that's the fourth axis of power between elected bodies, parliament executive, and non-elected fourth branch guarantor integrity institutions. The fifth axis, and this is a really important one, is between the state and the people. Now, the Indian constitution, like Every other constitution begins with the phrase, we the people, so the ringing phrase, we the people do enact, adopt, and give to ourselves this constitution. And then when you go further down, you find that after the preamble, the constitution just seems to forget about the people. They go off the stage and they're not seen anymore. And the only involvement that the constitution seems to envisage of the people is again through elections. But in between elections, there seems to be no involvement of the people in the conduct of lawmaking, administration, and so on. This is not something inevitable. So, for example, when the debates were happening in the Constituent Assembly, 
one proposal that was advanced was that of recall, the right to recall. So electors, citizens can recall the representatives if they think they're not doing a good job based on certain threshold requirements. That was voted down. In various other constitutions, you have explicit guarantees of public participation. So the government is obligated under the constitution to ensure that there is public participation in and before and after the making of laws, specifically in contexts like, say, environmental laws, when a law will say impact and the environment and the, the homelands of indigenous peoples, certain constitutions, especially in Latin America, provide a specific enshrined right to participation in that decision. So there are various ways in which we the people can actually mean we the people. There are ways in which to bring back the people into the constitutional firmament, as opposed to simply saying that, look, the people are actors only in elections. And beyond that, the only relevant constitutional actors are representatives. And if the people want to have an impact, they can protest, but there are no constitutional channels through which that they can get involved. So that's the difference between, say, representative democracy and direct democracy. That is a fifth axis of power. And the sixth axis is, again, simply state and individual. So, and here's where the Bill of Rights comes in. So the point of a fundamental rights chapter is to ensure that the vast power at the disposal of the state is mitigated and constrained in some way the imbalance of power between the individual and the state is redressed through the protection of rights. Something like, for example, the right against self-incrimination ensures that the power the police exercises over you in the police station, in the context in which you are completely vulnerable, has certain limits. And a rebalancing happens where there are things they can't do to you when they have you in their power. So that is the point of a Bill of Rights. So these are... I think one way of looking at the constitution is to look at it in terms of power maps. And these are six axes along which the constitution organizes power. And as we can see, there are different conflicting visions. So a centralized vision versus a more federal vision, a homogenous vision versus a more plural vision, a vision that focuses on horizontal distribution between houses of parliament, within parliament, and a vision that concentrates power in the executive a vision that limits democracy and the constitution to just representatives and elections, and a vision that sees a much more expansive role for citizens and the people. A vision that says that there is no need for accountability or oversight of the three wings of state, versus a vision that says that, yes, you do need other bodies to check and generate accountability. And of course, a vision that talks about the relative balance of power between state and individual. So these are the terrains of contestation in the constitution. The contestation happens along the text and in, as I said, in silences and interpretation, ambiguities and so on. And the basic case that I want to make is that if you look at the constitutional text, if you look at the constitution structure, and if you look at the judicial interpretation of the constitution over the last seven decades, these three things, what you find is a centralizing drift. Over the years, there has been a gradual move along these six axes of contestation towards a central and centralized idea of power at the cost of more plural decentralized visions. You see manifestations of it over the last few years because what you have is, after many years of coalition government, you have a majority government in power that is determined to push the limits of its power under the constitutional framework. So you see manifestations of it a lot in the last few years. But it would be a mistake to think of it as a problem of the present government. It is a problem that is, in my view, much deeper and is baked into the text and the structure and the interpretation of the constitution over the years. Article 1, India, that is Bharat, Union of States. So you have the union, you have the states as the two important component units of the Indian Federation. If you look at the constitutional text, uh, you will find that this is, is a skewed federation because there is a lot more power that the union has at the cost of the states. This is not controversial. I mean, this is, this is something everyone obviously knows about. 
So, for example, Article 3, Parliament can create new states, destroy states, modify their boundaries, and so on, unilaterally. The distribution of power to legislate and the fields under which legislation happens is set out under Schedule 7 of the Indian Constitution. So, List 1 is fields where Parliament legislates. List 2 is fields where states legislate. And List 3 is fields where they can both legislate. Something like land, for example, is a state subject, for instance. And what is crucial is a residuary power. So any power or any field that is not contained within these three lists, by default, the union the parliament legislates, right? So the default is that if you can't find something covered, then parliament has the power. If there is a clash between in the concurrent list between parliament and state law, parliamentary law prevails. Another example, if any state owes a debt to the center, the center can control its borrowing and every state owes debt to the center. So you have all these provisions that, you know, skew the balance. And that is not really of interest because that's something obvious. You can all see that. That is an interesting bit. The interesting bit is what follows from that, right? So you have this skewed structure and within that you have ambiguities, silences and so on. So when a dispute arises between the states and the center, how should we understand this skewed constitution and how should we resolve that dispute? And here you have a case that I call an inflection point. That is that a case where there were two stories still waiting to be told. There were two parts open to the court because the case came before the court to resolve as cases do. And the Supreme Court picked the centralizing route. And that's something you see across the axes. So this case is a case called State of West Bengal versus Union of India back in 1962, I think, was the year. So quite a way back when a lot was still open, a lot was still left to be decided. What happened was that Parliament passed an act called the Coal Bearing Areas Act. And they sought to acquire properties in various states, properties of various states, in order to engage in the production of coal. And one of the states was West Bengal. So West Bengal challenged the notifications under which the center sought to acquire state property to carry on its coal operations. The dispute turned upon entry 42 of list 3. So list 3 is the concurrent list where both parliament and state assemblies have the power to legislate, uh, field to legislate. List entry 42 says acquisition and requisitioning of property. So that was the source parliament claimed authority to, to legislate from that entry. State of West Bengal argued that when this provision says acquisition and requisitioning of property, you have to read it as carrying an implied exclusion. That is, acquisition and requisitioning of property except state property. And the reason for that, the state of West Bengal argued, is federalism. So if federalism means anything, it means that the different levels of government, center and states, are sovereign in their own departments and their own spheres. And so one of the important incidences of sovereignty is the ability to control your own property. And so therefore, if there is state property, parliament or the center should not be able to acquire it. And therefore, you should read this implied limitation into the text of Entry 42. So the majority of the Supreme Court rejected this argument. They upheld the notifications and there was a dissenting opinion. I'll come to that in a moment. What's interesting is that the majority told two stories. One was a historical story, a certain political history of India. And the second was the legal story of the consequences that flowed from that history. So what was the history? The history, according to the majority judgment, was that when representative government began in colonial India with 1909 reforms and so on, there was no concept of autonomy or federalism. Basically, always a centralized unitary state. Over time, there was some devolution of power to provinces. And, but at no point did the provinces of the states have an independent existence. So unlike in the US example, which the Supreme Court took as sort of the model federal example, where you had independent sovereign states that came together gave up their power, part of their powers to form a union. In the Indian case, you just had a unitary sort of entity with some devolution. And then at the moment of the constitution's framing, all power was given to the people and then given back in this federal form between states and the union. 
And so using this history, the Supreme Court then argued, the majority argued, that therefore there was no question of there being anything like federal sovereignty in their respective spheres. And then looking at the existing skew that was there in the constitutional text, all the things I mentioned before, the majority therefore said that this means that the Indian constitution is quasi-federal with a central bias. And therefore it follows that this notification is valid because the constitution is meant to favor central power over state power. And therefore there is no problem with the acquisition of state property. So that was the reading that the majority gave. And what I want to point out is that while the majority judgment feels like it is an inevitability, an inevitable historical story leading to an inevitable legal consequence, if you interrogate it a bit more closely, you find that neither of those two are sequiturs at all. So, for instance, the historical story is very contestable. As H.M. Sirvai, the great constitutional scholar, pointed out in his critique of this judgment, it completely misread the history because actually self-government in, in colonial India did begin with provincial autonomy. And there was strong provincial autonomy for 20-30 years. And there was a clear what Sirvai calls a federal situation that existed in India during the colonial times. And so while yes, it's true that the states are not independent as they were in the US, that is not a relevant difference. They existed, there was there were provincial movements. And so there's no warrant to assume that, that there was only a unitary state in India and there was no such concept of federalism before the constitution. So the historical story is contestable. And then the next contest is on what follows. So one reading is that, okay, look at the constitution. It has all these asymmetrical skewed provisions that favor the center over the states. And therefore, it follows that any dispute or ambiguity should be resolved in favor of the center because that's where the constitution leans. But that depends upon a certain default understanding of what the constitution is doing. Because the other equally plausible argument is that actually it is always meant to be a federal constitution. And therefore, wherever the constitution intended to depart from the federal arrangement, it did so in explicit terms. So wherever there is a skew in the constitutional text, it is made explicit, say, Article 3, where Parliament has the power to change state boundaries, or Schedule 7, where residuary power is with the Parliament. So wherever you want to depart from federalism, you explicitly make it clear. And it then follows that, therefore, where you haven't made it clear, where there is an ambiguity or a silence, the answer is that you have to resolve it in favor of the states, because the default is a federal compact, a federal arrangement. And so you can see that there are two equally plausible stories. One that reads history in a certain way and which then derives a certain legal consequence from that history. And the other is a different reading of history and then an equally different reading of the legal consequence flowing from that history. And the consequences themselves are massive when it comes to who has power under the constitution because in one case you are basically saying that wherever the constitution is silent and there are many such places, the center will have the power and that gives a huge amount of extra power to the center. On the other hand, you are saying that wherever there is silence or ambiguity, the states will have the power and that gives an equally massive swing to the states. And the Supreme Court in this case, the West Bengal, answered the question one way. It was till that point unanswered. So it answered the question one way and once it had... After that, the one path was opened and another was closed because now you have a binding, binding judgment that interprets the constitution in a particular way. And so that therefore takes us down one path and closes off the other. The dissenting judgment made all the points that I've just made. You know, and said that, look, ultimately, what is the point? The point is that any diverse plural country needs a federal compact to hold together. And if that is the normative baseline from which we start, then it follows that any ambiguity or silence should be resolved in favor of the federalism principle and not in favor of the centralizing principle. Though this case is interesting, not just because it was an important case that, that laid down the marker for how the Supreme Court would go on to look at this federal axis of power, but also because in these two judgments, majority and dissent, 
you see very starkly these two alternative readings of the constitution that really show you how the text is a terrain of contestation because in their own way both are plausible and it ultimately depends upon what you think the constitution is for and that will determine how you read a wide range of provisions and how you answer these really crucial conflicts that have such a great bearing on which way power will go under the constitution after this case this has become almost constitutional common sense that oh we are so if you read any text or any account or judgments you always find that oh we are a quasi federation it's skewed towards the center and so therefore you know it's not really a federation and if there's a dispute if there's a silence then obviously center has power and it sounds inevitable because now that's been the story for the last 60 years but what this case shows you that it wasn't inevitable and there were other stories and it was a choice that was made that this is the story we are going with at the cost of this other story and of course it then follows that even now it's not inevitable because any story can be changed or reversed and so on in many cases this sort of constitutional common sense played an important role in cases where you wouldn't often think of it so cases challenging national security laws afspa tada all had federalism arguments being made that look there is a silence in the constitution and this is not a power the center has and each time the court said but because it's ambiguous therefore the center has the power in cases involving distribution of finances cases involving the mp lad scheme you know cases involving the reorganization of states and so on each time you have this contestation happening and each time you have like a a more and more of an encrustation of this idea that because the constitution skews towards the center therefore we must read it as entrenching that skew even further when there is a doubt and you know the point is that that is not what needs to happen so just to conclude then i think that understanding the constitution through the lens of power really reveals certain important insights that perhaps you know are uh, missed if we focus exclusively on rights in fact the question of rights itself is embedded in how the constitution organizes and distributes power and um, if we look at the constitution closely we see that there is you know a terrain of contestation along many axes one vision is a centralized vision and one vision is a much more plural and and diverse vision and over the years there's been a drift towards the former but and i'll end on this no drift is ever irreversible and so if we do think that the more plural the more diverse the more decentralized vision is a more attractive one then that's something that's worth um, you know struggling for inside the courtroom outside wherever you know in in discourse and debate and so on and so with that i will close thank you thank you for staying on for the full conversation if you like what you heard please share it with family and friends you can also leave us a review on itunes or apple podcasts the crew that makes these podcasts possible are gora krishna and ishan gupta on sound supervision and production with support from s sarvanaraj and raghavendra tenkaila Artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studios. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. Do follow us on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter to get regular updates on our programming. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at PIC.